Hey, Print Hustlers, Bruce from Printavo, Simple Shop Management Software. We are really excited. We've got a very special guest with us. We've got our co-host, Stephen Farragut at Campus Inc., and we've got president of Sandmar, Jeremy Lott. Hey, guys. How are you? Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us, Jeremy. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Happy to be here. Yeah, we've got a lot of questions, Jeremy. I think that's just because Sandmar is uh, such a big part of our space uh, in the screen printing industry and just wanting to learn more about it, especially from the leadership angle um, that you have. I mean, just kicking it off, can you give us a sense of Sandmar's scale? I, I know you guys are so vertically integrated, but you know, yeah. maybe how many people, garments, all this stuff. My dad started the company in 1971, so next year will be our 50th year in business. Um, and, you know, Sandmar has over 4,000 employees uh, across the United States. We have 10 distribution centers, six plus million square feet of distribution space. And Sandmar is the largest supplier of apparel to what we kind of think of as this imprinted sportswear world. So everything from, you know, printers to promotional products companies to industrial laundries, team dealers, kind of et cetera. And that's kind of where we uh, where we fit in space, based in just outside uh, Seattle um, in a little town called Issaquah, Washington. Wow. So Jeremy, in the family business, when did you get your calling to uh, join in or were you on the front lines as a teenager? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, I started, uh, I was telling people I've started here at birth, which is partially true. You know, when I grew up, Sandmar was just a small business. And when you have a small business, your kids are free labor. So we would go on weekends and work in the business and stuff envelopes. So I, I mean, I always worked in the business and I always kind of wanted to be in it. My dad, I think, did a really good job of early on, like involving us in a positive way, kind of, and to make it something we always wanted to do. I mean, when I was like 14, I would get to go to trade shows with him. And that was really cool because I would get to miss school for a couple of days and go on a trip with my dad. And, you know, I would sit there and hand out catalogs, and trade shows. So, I, I mean, I always loved business. We used to do these fishing trips um, in the 80s. It, it's hard to think now, but, you know, all of our manufacturers, Hanes, Fruit of the Loom, uh, you know, it's kind of pre-Gildan, at least for us, were all made in the USA. And they were all, there was a shortage of T-shirts in the United States. So we were on allocation with all of these people. And so one of the ways that you differentiated was just you could get more allocation, you could sell more shirts. And so we really worked to build good relationships with our with these mills. And so we would take them on these fishing trips in the summer. So we'd fly to Seattle and we'd go up to Canada and stay at these lodges. Anyway, and they were great trips. And so I would go as a kid and I would bartend for all these guys. And so I learned to make like really good Bloody Marys in the morning and kind of stuff. And so you know, like for me, that's what the business was. It was like, you know, bartending for these guys and going out fishing and <laughs> going to trade shows with my dad. And so I always wanted to be in the business, but I wanted to do something, you know, on my own too. So after school, I uh, did a stint as an investment banker, which is a terrible job that I wouldn't recommend for anybody. Got my MBA and then started full-time in Sanmar in June of 2002. And I've been here full-time since. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So has Sanmar always been selling like blank goods um, or did the business start as something else in transition to that? Yeah, I mean, we were actually, my dad was a decorator uh, really early on. He got his biggest order ever and it was for 1,200 shirts. They were yellow t-shirts for the Seattle Supersonics. This is like late 70s. And he, at the time, ordered from the largest wholesaler in America, a um, company that doesn't even exist anymore. And he ordered them, and, and he'd ordered like 100% cotton, Hanes t-shirts. And they came in, and some were Hanes, and some were for the loom, and some were cotton, and some were 50-50. And he called the company he'd ordered them from, and he said, you know, this isn't what I ordered. And the guy said, you're a COD customer. Uh, you've got your shirts. We've got your money. The deal is done. And like hung up on my dad. And so... My dad was pissed and he went home and he's like complaining to my mom and she said, well, look, they're the biggest and that's the way they treat their customers. Like, you know, why don't you go compete with them? And so he decided he was going to become a wholesaler and he sent a letter to all of his, uh, all the other screen printers in Seattle that there was not a lot of them at the time, basically said, I'm not going to be your competitor anymore. Here's my customer list. He sent them everyone he'd done printing for and said, but I'd love to be your supplier and went into the supplier kind of side of the business and has been doing that since. That's incredible. I mean, as you got involved in the business and started to transition into a leadership role, 
how was that? Was it easy? I mean, for being responsible for 4,000 you know, plus people and families, everything yeah. is no small task. <laughs> when you work in a family business, you're like acutely aware that um, you know, you're there because you're the boss's son, right? And so there's this sense, I, I think you can handle that lots of different ways. For me, I really wanted to always prove that like I deserved to be there and I wasn't just nepotism, you know? And, and so I, I worked really hard. I didn't start as like vice president of the company. I mean, came in and I started in our pricing department. And I think what my dad was really good though about growing me career wise, but always in a way that was, you know, if I made, I was never in a position where if I made too big of a mistake, you know, I could really create that much damage. So it was like, he would he was smart about how he advanced kind of me through the company. And I was so lucky to have not only him as a mentor, but other people at Sanmar who were, you know, had years of experience, but who recognized that for this to maintain as a family business, that they were invested in growing me. And so they really took me on um, and mentored me. And so I'm super grateful for the people, my dad, of course, but also a lot of the people that worked uh, at Sanmar. Some continue to work at Sanmar. Some have retired who've really mentored me kind of over the years. And then I really had to prove to everyone that I deserved it. And so I worked my ass off to get here. Uh, but yeah, it, it's certainly, it's a, just a unique challenge you have in a family business. That's sure. awesome. So when do you think Sanmar really like transitioned from small business to big business? When did the distribution centers really open and it became like, you know, an international company, I guess now. But when yeah. was the transition? Tell us a little bit about that. I think there's a few inflection points that really like catapulted the business. So in the 70s and 80s, it was super local industry. There were hundreds of distributors. It was like dry goods wholesalers across the country. And, you know, like we sold in the Seattle area and that was really it. You know, maybe we had a customer in Portland. That's about as far as we went. But I talked a little bit before about allocation. And so um, in the late 80s, when we were we were able to get more allocation than our competitors were on at least on the west coast and that allowed us to ship down to california and so that was huge because california was this giant market compared to the seattle market into the like late 80s being able to have more allocation when the wholesalers there were out uh, and we had stock we were able to ship into california that was one of the kind of big inflection points. I think the second piece was maybe uh, early 90s and so in 1994 we started doing private label and, you know, at, at the time, if you think about the, the power and difference between the mills and the wholesalers, it was we were just completely at their mercy. We started making our own product. And I think the fact that we were in Seattle and they didn't necessarily see the biggest brand of polo at the time was Outer Banks. I don't know if you guys remember Outer Banks. It, it got ended up getting bought by Haynes and doesn't exist anymore. But, you know, if Outer Banks would have recognize that, oh, Sanmar is going to go, you know, at the time we went to Hong Kong and we, you know, built a polo or built a jacket that could really compete with them. They could have put us out of business at the time. But I, I just think the fact that we were so small and they didn't recognize it um, gave us this advantage over time to the point where we had built this significant private label that allowed us to really kind of differentiate. So, you know, early, you know, 80s with allocation, early 90s with building our own brands. You know, I think those were two big things that helped us move into becoming kind of a bigger company. We started to expand geographically, you know, into the 2000s. We moved kind of across the country, opening up distribution centers for us. We would rather go into a market and compete than, um, than go make an acquisition. So we grew organically kind of throughout and then just continue to build our capacity uh, as a company. But I think maybe the last thing I'll share was we were a sourcing company into the 90s and, and, and early 2000s and like pretty good at that. Um, and I always tell this story because um, I think when Alpha Broder introduced Devin and Jones, this is like in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, they did a really great job of merchandising that line. The guy who originally created it was a really talented merchant. And I think it was a real kick in the pants for us to say like, hey, it's okay to be a great sourcing company but you've got to be a great merchandising design apparel company. And, and so we were really invested. And today I think we have a world-class design sourcing manufacturing kind of team built from people from like lots of different apparel companies from mostly in the Northwest, mostly sports companies like Nike and Columbia and 
uh, Nordstrom's product group and Eddie Bauer, et cetera, but really a world-class product team. And so we transitioned uh, really from being just kind of doing private label and being sourcing to being a really great apparel company. And, and I think that's really helped propel our growth in the last decade. That's, that's incredible. With each of those wins, were there any big missteps that you remember that, that you looked back and, you know, could have gone a different direction? For sure. I mean, I think that, the, you know, one of the things we've been able to do, though, is really figure out how to, how to turn things in a positive way. So we create, when we first created Cornerstone, which is our kind of workwear brand, we, we recognized that in the, the laundry channel was consolidating. These big national laundries were buying regional laundries and the companies that were servicing them with uniforms that were going out of business. And we thought, well, if we could just have a, you know, SP11 or, and a PT20, you know, just SP14 and PT20, just really basic pant and shirt, which was 80% of the market you know, we could go compete with Red Cap and really try to get some of these laundry business. And and we beat our head against the wall for like four or five years trying to compete with them and really getting nowhere. But we what we ended up doing two things. We ended up, one, just carrying Red Cap, which made a lot more sense. They were much better at making that product than we were. And what we found was the laundries didn't want to buy that product from us, but we taught them how to do direct sale. And so we started selling them polos and jackets and all the things we never thought we would sell them uh, because we built these relationships trying to sell them this uniforms they really didn't want to buy from us. You know, it's just an example of, you know, being our heads against the wall for several years and then realizing, hey, you know, how can we actually make a, a positive kind of out of this? But uh, yeah, I mean, lots of mistakes <laughs> along the way as, we, as we've grown, for sure. Uh, fortunately, none that have been, you know, that big that, that really put us in a hard place. Gotcha. And for anyone like listening at home or watching, Sanmar has always been privately owned, never really acquired or anything like that. It's, it's all been organic since the start. Yeah. So, you know, my, my, it was my parents uh, initially, and then uh, my brother and I uh, own part of the company today, although my parents are still the majority owners. We had um, at one time bought part of it. We were minority owners in a brand called Ogio that we sell. We make bags and shirts, uh, but we, that business ended up getting sold to um, Callaway Golf Company. So they own it completely today. And then we've invested kind of to be more vertical. So we have a joint venture in manufacturing in Central America to make t-shirts and sweatshirts. We have an office in Hong Kong, but that we opened, we looked at, we've looked at acquisitions over time, but none that have really made sense for us. So how do you balance, you know, when you want to be vertically integrated, like, you know, Port Authority, Port and Company, and when you want to find a private label? You talked a little bit about the Red Cap, but, you know, merch is changing daily. Are you guys trying to develop new lines or just, you know, expand on what you've already created or just keep those as consistent channels? Like, how do you balance that out in, in your strategy? Yeah, so we have three categories. We have our retail brands, Nike, North Face, uh, you know, Eddie Bauer, New Air, et cetera, Carhartt. We have our private label brands, Port Authority, Sport Tech. And then we have what we think of as mill brands, uh, Hanes, Gildan, Fruit of the Loom, Jerseys, et cetera. We're invested in all kind of three, but we're really thoughtful about the brands that we add. So we recognize there's companies out there that have more brands than us. We think we have the best brands. So we think of it as um, our retail partnerships are usually exclusive. So Nike says, we want to be exclusive with you in this corporate channel. And in exchange, we don't want, here's our group of competitors, you know, Under Armour, Adidas, et cetera, that we don't want you to carry. And so that's a relate, that's what we do with most of our retail brands. The same thing with Carhartt. You know, we have an exclusive relationship with Carhartt for this channel, but we don't carry Dickies or other workwear brands. We like to think those brands sit on top of from a uh, certainly from a price point standpoint, our private label brands. And so we continue to invest in Port Authority is mid-priced kind of corporate wear, or Sport Tech is our team fan wear, or District is our fashion brand, you know, et cetera. And we may add private labels over time and we may add retail over time, but they have to sit in those channels. And then when we look at our mill brands, you know, we want to make sure that um, we, you know, we don't carry all of them. Um, we we think that we have deep relationships with the mills that we do carry. We want to make sure that we can service the brand really well. Um, and we have to make sure that it makes sense from a, you know, that, that we can sell it and, and do it profitably. And so, uh, and we really think at every case about can Sanmar, uh, you know, 
the manufacturer or the brand has to make money selling to us. Sandler has to make money and our customer has to make money. And we've looked at brands before where those things, they're great brands, but one of those things didn't happen. Retail brands are really interesting because our customer has to be able to be price competitive relative to a similar retail price for a retail brand. If they can't do that and make an appropriate margin, we can't carry the brand. We certainly have a different strategies for each of those three uh, categories of product. That makes sense. You guys have worked uh, or now starting to partner with Allmade, which we did an awesome interview with Ryan and with Brett and a couple of the Allmade team members. I know that a lot of your team members, especially at the trade shows, have been really pushing green initiatives. I think you had another private label that you're working on too. And, and also the manufacturing aspect and being more green there. We saw some neat videos about from those facilities. But, you know, where does that thought process, I guess, what is the thought process behind that and, and pointing the, the company in, in that direction? Yeah. So I think, I think a few things. I mean, one, as I think about just green in general and sustainability, maybe more specifically, I think there's just this moral imperative that we have as people to be more sustainable. I mean, I've got we have one earth and I want it to be here for my kids and grandkids. And, and so there's that piece for me that's just a uh, piece. We also think that it's becoming more and more important to our customers and to end users uh, that a product is made uh, in safe, sustainable, you know, compliant kind of ways. And so we've invested hugely in our supply chain to make it as sustainable as possible and to continue to kind of improve. And, um, you know, I'm, I first talked to Ryan for, uh, uh, two years ago, uh, like at the ISS show, and he kind of showed me this T-shirt that he was making, and kind of told me the story of it. And I thought, well, that was really cool, but you know, what, uh, I wasn't sure kind of how it would fit kind of for us. And then last year, we got back together, had a similar conversation, and and he's just down in you know kind of Vancouver, Washington, or near Portland, and so he came up to the office after the show, and we talked. And they had built something that I thought was really cool, the brand, the product, the fact that it was like designed and made by printers and kind of printer forward, I thought was this really interesting place that nobody else had been in the industry. The, the fact that like these group of founders were so engaged in it and thoughtful about kind of the brand. And so we could create, you know, our own brand that was sustainable, but they had something that was really special, I thought there. But they didn't really know how to run a, a t-shirt company, that's not what they did. You know, they were a group of printers and, and you know, obviously Ryan sells equipment and supplies to printers, but it's just a really different business. You know, we thought it was just really great partnership because they could bring to us um, that energy that they have and the, the way they thought about it. And we could bring the supply chain and the knowledge and the distribution and, and capital and all those things that Sandmark could bring to it. And it just could be really successful. And so we're super excited about the opportunity to sell all made and, and what that brand could do. At the same time, we're continuing to invest in sustainability in our other brands, but really throughout our supply chain. So in our district line, we have the Reti, which is this 100% recycled t-shirt. It's this really cool product that I think is, I, I can say with confidence, is probably the greenest t-shirt that you can buy. But we do things like in our manufacturing, use biomass to generate energy. And we think a lot about we have the largest solar installation in Central America on the roof of our building. So there's a lot of really cool things that we're doing uh, within the supply chain uh, to make it as sustainable as possible. How does you know, that Jeff, biomass? Oh, sorry, Steve. Go ahead. How does go that ahead, biomass part work? If you think about a textile facility for a second, it's uh, it's a huge energy user because what it is is giant washing machines and dryers, you know, that dye these kind of fabrics. Um, and if you think about your house, even your dryer uses a ton of energy, right? But think about that as like a 3000 pound washing machine and dryer. So the scale of it, the energy needs are dramatic. Energy can be like the second biggest cost of making a t-shirt after yarn. I mean, people don't recognize that, but energy is huge from a cost standpoint and use. Well, in a lot of these developing countries, you don't necessarily just plug into the grid. You know, when we open a warehouse in the United States, we never think about power. We're like, we think about labor and we think about shipping and we think about you know these things like we just assume that power is going to be there anywhere we go that's not true in the developing world so you operate in an industrial park and then frequently you're generating power as a park or in a group of parks so when we first went to honduras they were generating power using bunker fuel which is a really dirty petroleum product that 
that frankly makes acid rain. I mean, it's a really, it's not, uh, it's not a sustainable product and it's, a, it's not a clean product. We transitioned away from bunker into biomass. So biomass is, uh, we grow a grass called king grass. They do this in Brazil with sugar cane, but king grass has a higher like caloric value than sugar cane does. So when it uh, burns, it creates more energy. So we grow this grass, we mill it, they separate the liquid and the solid. The liquid goes into these tanks and creates uh, like methane gas that turns these um, engines and generates energy. And then the solid gets burnt and creates steam that creates kind of more power. And so it's a you know 50 megawatt power generation facility. And then what's left from the king grass goes back in the fields from uh, as, as fertilizer. So it's a really like closed kind of system. It's a renewable energy. It's a much greener uh, energy than than certainly the bunker gas, bunker fuel was. And so it's pretty cool to be part of that. So we don't own any of the uh, power generation. Our partner there does with other kind of partners, but we also benefit from it as part of the cost. Now, bunker is really cheap today because of where oil prices are. So depending on how oil prices are, we win or lose with this, but we think it's a real a positive trade-off because of uh, just the environmental kind of piece of it. It's well worth it for us, even if we could be saving a few cents today if we were burning bunker. But anyway, it's been a really cool piece to be part of. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, so Jeremy, um, what we will touch on, and I know, you know, you've probably been flooded with this. Let's talk a little bit about pandemic. What, you know, where were you? What happened? What started going through your mind? And then what was the quick action plan? I guess, you know, walk us through what that looked like a little bit. I always go back to February 11th because we had a board meeting. I gave this whole talk about how the virus was in China and what it might mean to our supply chain, our Chinese factories. We, we, we don't do that much production in China anymore, but we have fabric in China that's made in other countries. We were worried about our supply chain. And nobody, these are really smart people in this boardroom. Nobody was like, oh, somebody could get on a plane and like come to the US and the virus could come here. You know, like it was just not something we even thought about. And then, but being in Seattle, we were kind of early to see it because we were one of the earliest kind of places where it spiked. And so I started to get nervous about it. And I brought the team together and we took 5% out of our projections for the year. We thought we were going to grow like 8% and we took it down to like growing 3%. And we thought, well, yeah, that's probably right. You know, two weeks later, the NBA had a game and the players like walked off the court after a guy tested positive, like pregame. And Tom Hanks announced he had kind of COVID and it was like the world just stopped. We already had a really robust work at home program. Our whole entire kind of CSR team and, and credit team works from home. So I had like 500 at home workers going into this. So we sent everybody else home. We figured out how to do that. I'm also like kind of paranoid just as a person, like I'm like anxious and paranoid. So I like early on just thought like this could get bad. And so we were kind of ahead of like sending people home. Like we started going to triage mode because we started seeing our sales just drop off a cliff in a way that we never thought we would see. You know, we froze hiring initially. We cut, I had to cut salaries. Um, I took my salary down to a dollar. I cut hours for people. Uh, we, we did anything we could to kind of cut costs. We started working with our vendors to say, what can we do around orders? Because if you think about our business, we have uh, anywhere from and a Gildan t-shirt, I'm buying from their warehouse in the United States. So I have a four day lead time to a Carhartt jacket. I might have a 270 day lead time on it. So. I have all these orders in place, assuming the business was going to be good. And now the business is down, you know, 75%. And so my inventory is going like this and my sales are going like this. And that's a bad place to be. We started working with our vendors. I'm super proud to say we didn't cancel any orders. You know, most apparel companies just went to their factories and said, we're not paying for anything. Don't ship it. We worked with our van vendors to say, how can we delay it? How can we push it out? What can we do together to kind of get through this? And we didn't lay anybody off. We had to cut hours and cut salaries, but we kept our whole team kind of in place. Those two things have paid real dividends for us because as the business started, so, and it was scary because we didn't know how long we were going to be down or how, you know, what that sure. looked like. But as the business started to come back, we were able to really easily bring our people back in terms of the hours. We never shut. We had to shut one of our DCs down for two weeks because of COVID cases that we had. But it was getting to back to operational was really quick for us. And then we shifted to making uh, we got a government contract to turn our factories back on to make uh, protective masks. That, along with just our core business coming back, has allowed us to bring 
everybody back to full hours and full salary kind of today. And so feel really super proud of kind of that. You know, we're not back to where we were last year. You know, we're sitting today down about 25% from where we were, but that's a heck of a lot better than we were in, you know, April when we were down 75%. So we feel really good about how the business has come back. You know, the, the other kind of like crazy part was sitting there in March, we didn't know if the like world was ending. And so we have a line of credit with our bank and we took the whole thing into cash because we were worried about what, what could happen. So we're sitting with cash that we never really do have. And we started trying to go borrow more money. Adage is really true. Like when you don't need money, banks are there <laughs> to lend you. And when you do it, like they don't return your phone calls, you know? And so it was really challenging process, but we're actually really close today to completing kind of a, a new line of credit and a term loan that we put in place to really, in my mind, like bulletproof the business so that, you know, no matter what happens this fall with the virus, we feel like this company sustains kind of through it. So um, feel really pretty good about where we are and, and the work we've done. Wow. How do you like mental toughness, leadership, like what are your tricks, tips like that that keep you going to keep everyone pumped up, energized, rallied, knowing that like banks aren't returning your calls? Right. You know, I think if you ask my employees and my wife, they would have different stories because it's been, um, you know, I think that like I, I recognize what, uh, you know, my role in the company is a, a, a sense of like, strength and calm and and strategy and and i and i know that role that i need to play you know that doesn't mean that like i you know i don't get home and i'm like scared and you know like stressed and and so it was it certainly kind of a really challenging time but i think for me i really tried to recognize what my team kind of needed and what our company needed and and that was really important for me to kind of do that there's a lot of people that really depend on on us as the company. The other thing we did was to really communicate with our team, like, and be as transparent as we could, like, this is what's going on. This is where we are. This is, you know, the strategy. I don't know that we've always done that. And so every week I was either sending emails or doing a video or doing webinars or town hall meetings with, with SAMR employees, uh, because it really was important for me to stay out in front of that communication so that they were hearing from me uh, directly they knew what was going on. Like if you're in our call center and you normally take 80 phone calls a day and you're taking five, like, you know, there's a problem, you know? And if you're in logistics and you know, we normally ship our many packages and now we're shipping this many, like, you know, they, so to not be transparent was kind of silly, but also being optimistic and being kind of calm. If I'm panicking, that doesn't help anybody. And so I really tried, you know, to kind of focus on what our team really needed, you know, and then I could kind of go home and cry to my wife, you know, at night. But that was, that, that, that's, that's really kind of how I've gotten through it. And then good wine and a few margaritas along the way. Too, you know. <laughs> How, how do you prioritize your day now with so many different departments and, and things operationally happen? How do you say this is the most important thing I'm supposed to be focusing on or this group I need to work on? What, what defines yeah. that? I think I did a better job like in normal world of kind of work-life balance. You know, when you're working at home, I would go to the office, you know, I usually go in pretty early, you know, this is called pre-COVID and I'd work and I'd go home and I was like pretty good at like turning off work. You know, but when you're working from home, it's like I'd wake up and I'd walk to the computer, which is like 10 feet, you know, and I'd work all day and I'd like break for lunch and I'd go back, you know, and then I'd, after dinner, I'd go back and I was I, I was working a lot, probably too much. Triggering out how to find that balance is a little bit hard because there's so much going on. I, I'm though so I'm super fortunate that uh, of the team that we have at Sanmar today. I, I mean, I think throughout our history, we've had great people, but I, I really think the team that's in place today is really world-class. So my job is really helping set that kind of bigger direction to work with the team. And so I, I spend a lot of my day meeting with kind of our teams and, and our, our leadership team. And so for me, like that tends to be the most important thing. You know, have I, you know, when we were doing these bank agreements, you know, I'm on the phone with bankers or I'm doing Zoom calls with bankers, or I'm doing, you know, presentations. I mean, those things are important, but the most important time I spend is with my kind of leadership team. Um, and so that's really what I prioritize kind of, you know, kind of in my day. The coolest part of this, you know, if there's positives to COVID was, you know, even though I haven't 
we haven't been in a room together in you know four months. The team has worked so incredibly well because I think all of the BS that we normally, you know, I don't think we're a super political organization, but like there's some, there's always some of that that exists in every company. And everybody kind of was like, once we got into this like mode, it was like, well, what do we have to do to get through this? You know, and everybody's just working together in a really amazing way. And and the team has stepped up. And, and so it's been, it's been really uh, cool to be a part of seeing all that happen but yeah I, I probably working too much and not doing a good enough job of figuring out how to prioritize those things it's, it's tough that's awesome yeah and even as a customer from my you know my rep to even hopping on a call with monty like you know and, and even with you we felt that you guys have been able to do that for the industry so we applaud you for that um and and have seen y'all checking in i was even i was on a zoom call with my rep and i was like this is kind of cool like I'm not worrying about fires right now. I'm like focused on you. We went through like all these different things and, and, and I learned a bunch more. So I think there's a lot of good that's coming out of it as well when working with, um, you know, with, with companies like Sanmar. And, and I think it'll change the landscape. It'll be interesting to see trade shows and things like that. But I think right. there, there is a little bit of positive that's come out of it. So. Well, for sure. I mean, you know, if our rep in Chicago, I mean, he spends his whole day in a car sitting in traffic, right? You know, in the regular world, right? So you know, if you can do Zoom presentations and be effective and do six a day instead of two, because, you know, I mean, there, there's ways I think the technology and how we're all learning to kind of work this way, you know, might have longer lasting impacts too. And and I think there's obviously lots of people are talking about what's the, you know, the new normal, but I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, it'll be pretty interesting to see how the world changes. Because of this too. Just wrapping up on your end, what do you feel like is next for Sandmar? Like, where are you guys investing in? We continue to invest in technology. That's a huge piece of what we're doing. So uh, in the middle of like work at home and pandemic, we decided to do an ERP implementation just to like, you know, increase my stress level. You know, that was a long overdue piece of kind of technology. And we have a huge roadmap beyond that, um, whether it's more automation in our distribution centers or, you know, other pieces from, from a customer standpoint, I, we'll continue to make really big technology investments. I think we have to do that. To, to stay up, you know, from a product standpoint, we have new brands that we're working with right now. We'll, you know, nothing I can announce today, but things are coming into next year. Uh, some things that are really exciting around kind of new product. And so I think there's some really great things that you're going to see, you know, kind of coming from us in the next couple of years. We think it's 2022 before we get back to like sales levels of 2019. I mean, we think it's going to be uh, a two year kind of build to get back up. We're hoping it's faster than that. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, when, if we get a, you know, effective vaccine. I'm optimistic about the future for really two things. I mean, I think one, I'd say mostly the way the business has come back. Uh, we think we've taken market share through this, uh, but we just, the, the durability of the business. And then I think the other piece is just our team and how people have worked and pulled together. And, and that, that gives me a lot of optimism for the future. So we're, uh, we're excited. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. We really appreciate the time. Uh, this is Bruce from Pentau. We've got Stephen Farrick and Jeremy Lott joining president of Sandmar. Thanks guys for listening. We'll see you guys again next week. Yeah, thank you.